Do you remember, Jane? Ah. Great. Thank you. So we're off. Yes. Are we off? Yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, James, for the introduction and also for inviting me to, to give this lecture. Is that okay? Because I've got two microphones on. You sure? Yep. Okay. So thank you very much for coming as well and giving up a sort of cold, you know, sort of January, Thursday evening to come to this lecture. So I hope I can make it worth it for you. So I'm an immunologist, as James said, and what I'm going to talk to you about is how um, uh, the immune system is being used to, um, uh, as a force against cancer, as part of our um, defense mechanisms against cancer. And uh, through this, new immunotherapies have been developed, which I'm sure you've heard a bit about from, from our newspapers, who have very much hyped up cancer immunotherapy as the sort of great cancer hope, the, the one-stop shop for um, curing cancer and, and so on. So what's sort of behind all of this hype? Um, what, what's the science behind it? How significant is this breakthrough? And are we looking at the tip of the iceberg or have we done all that you know, we, we can do in terms of harnessing our immune systems? So the first thing I'm going to do is spend just a few slides just talking about, well, what is cancer? And what cancer is, um, in simple terms, it's a disease of cells. So people have around 100 million million cells, and within these there are at least 200 different um, cell types. And when, you, um, when cancer develops, it's, some, it's a disease that develops as a result of uncontrolled proliferation of one or more of these um, different cell types. So uh, just to sort of, um, uh, sort of come back a little bit, we have to understand what normal cells do. So normal cells also divide. They have to divide in order that um, people, animals, organisms can grow. Also, you need cells to divide for the process of development and also to repair. So this is something that happens all the time. And uh, we know that this... It's very difficult, actually, to <laughs> use the pointer here. That this happens by one cell dividing into two, then that cell divides into four, then into eight, and so on. So this is normal cell division. Now, in the past minute, so in the time that I've been speaking your body has already made 144 million new red blood cells, 35 million gut cells and 40,000 or thereabouts skin cells. That's incredible. That's the amount of cell division that goes on in your body, one cell becoming two, becoming four, and, and so on. This is a, a phenomenal process that happens at quite, quite a rate. So normal cell division is what I've just been telling you about. You know, you have identical cells dividing one into two, two into four, and so on. It's not a perfect process. So every now and again, you do end up with a damaged cell. But the body also has mechanisms that it puts into place to get rid of these damaged cells. And so what normally happens is that the instructions from your DNA will um, put into place mechanisms that will get rid of this damaged cell. So the cell is damaged, it hasn't divided properly, and therefore the right thing to have happen is that that cell then dies and is removed. But cancer cell division is what happens if that cell that is damaged manages to put processes into place that means it can get past these normal sort of safeguarding mechanisms that should make that cell die, but which have gone wrong. And then that damaged cell gets to divide into two, and then into four, and so on. And that is when cancer happens. So a damaged cell manages to escape the normal mechanisms that norm normally would send it down a death pathway, allowing it to survive. And that's a bad situation because you've got a defective cell that has survived and that defective cell goes on to make more and more defective cells. So um, the, 
that what I'm talking about here are the genetic instructions that normally tell a cell when to stop dividing or which normally sort of tidy up a damaged cell and get rid of it, those instructions have now gone wrong. And that can happen as a normal result of an aging process. It's accelerated by carcinogens such as tobacco, which can introduce mutations into your DNA, hence um, um, bypassing those normal um, instructions and putting other instructions in place, such as survival signals to damage cells. UV light from um, exposure to too much sun also can cause mutations that can also alter your DNA in a way that these genetic instructions go awry and then your damaged cell gets to survive. Viruses can also do this. They can hijack cells in the sense that when a cell would normally die, a virus will switch on its own instructions, helping that cell then to survive. And so tumours form they form as a result of these instructions um, being incorrect. So the wrong instructions are being given to the cell. The cell ought to be um, being told to stop dividing and to die, but it's now bypassing all of that and it's carrying on dividing. And that's when tumours form, as you can, can see here. So what is it then about a cancer cell that really makes it different from a healthy cell? Well, we know that they're different in 10 sort of key ways. I've already talked about the unstable and damaged DNA. This is the fundamental problem that starts the whole process off. The so-called instructions are now not being delivered properly. So they grow without being told to grow. They can multiply forever. There's no stopping these cells once their DNA are giving these wrong instructions. They can also do other things like hijack inflammation. So inflammation is very important in, in order to combat infections and so on. But these inflammatory mediators that are made in response to infection are actually used by cancer cells as growth factors to grow more. So inflammation is actually something that um, often can promote cancer growth. They don't have self-destruct signals either, like other cells might do. So other cells will have, you know, normal cells will have instructions telling them, don't grow anymore, that's enough, you know, stop. But those instructions have all gone wrong in cancer cells. They do not self-destruct. And then what happens is that all cells, in order to grow, need to have a source of oxygen. They need to have nutrients. And when these cancer cells grow uncontrollably, they often, not always, but they often form lumps and bumps. And um, they can then grow their own system of blood vessel networks that will penetrate those tumours in order to provide the oxygen and nutrients to those cells that are in the middle of those um, lumps and bumps. And so they, have, um, they, they evolve, basically, the capacity to feed themselves through being able to send out signals to grow whole new blood vessel networks. They also have signals that allow them to invade other tissues. And once they get there, they then evolve. So if they manage to get to the lung, they learn to adapt to what it is you need to be able to grow well in, in the lung or in the prostate or in the bone. So they're very adept at altering their instructions in order to evolve, to survive in a different environment. They're very, very good at this. And of course, the other thing they can do is they can hide from the immune system. And that is something that I will talk about now in a, in a little bit of detail. I've also, I'm also talking about, um, I've also mentioned here, reprogramming energy use. And what that actually means is that cells, uh, your normal cells, need a certain amount of oxygen. They need a certain amount of nutrients. But cancer cells can evolve to be able to survive even in conditions of low oxygen or nutrient deprivation. So again, they can reprogram the way they use energy in order to be able to survive very um, hostile conditions. So as you can see, by putting all of these um, pathways into place, they are able to survive very, very efficiently in... Um, in many different kinds of environments because one of the things that has happened as a result of their altered DNA and unstable DNA is that they can adapt to those um, conditions. And you can see from um, cancer treatments where 
you know, you, you probably have the impression that this is a game of cat and mouse. You give a treatment and you will be able to control a cancer perhaps for a, for a certain period of time until it has adapted and evolved in order to escape whatever toxic effect that treatment was throwing at it. And it's this ability to adapt all the time that makes it such a difficult um, disease to, to actually... Um, uh, get completely on top of and to, and to have actual cures from treatments. So the, the purpose of this lecture actually is to talk very specifically about well, what is the relationship between the immune system and cancer. And this is a very interesting question that, you know, scientists and clinicians have pondered for at least, you know, 150 years, probably uh, much more. So the first thing to think about is, well, what do you know about your, your immune system? What do we know that it actually um, does for us? And, and the thing that immediately comes to mind is that the main role of our immune systems is to fight infection. We, the immune system has certainly evolved in order to do this, and you can see here some nice pictures of some rod-like bacteria there, some spiky viruses, and a rather nasty-looking um, worm here. Um, but that's what your immune system does. It keeps your body safe from all manner of bugs, bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi, and, and, and so on. And that is definitely its number one job. That's the primary job. So back to the question, can the immune system kill cancer? Well, it seems that it does. We know from all the hype, all the newspapers, that yes, this is the great cancer hope and that the immune system can indeed be harnessed to to kill cancer. So why is that? And, and why is it that it's taken us such a long time to, to understand this? I think it's quite interesting to, to sort of just spend a couple of slides looking at taking a sort of historical perspective of um, studies on the immune system and cancer. And, you know, as I said, people have been talking about it for at least 150 years. This is what you can find sort of in the literature. Rudolf Virchow, um, published in 1863 that he could, he could observe pus cells in, in cancers. So this is what we now think of, of course, as immune cells. Um, so, so that sort of pussy infiltrate has been noted, you know, for a very long time. And then um, a German scientist called Paul Ehrlich in 1909 posed the question, well, what do these immune cells do? You know, are they just bystanders inside these cancers, or are they actually involved in attacking and, and killing cancer? I think one of the sort of big pioneers in cancer immunology um, was a surgeon called William Coley. And he was actually a bone surgeon who was based at the, um, uh, I, the Sloan Kettering Hospital in New York, which I think then was called the Memorial Hospital. But anyway, he was a bone surgeon who worked on a cancer called sarcoma. And so he would actually perform surgery to remove these bone cancers. And he just made the observation that when these um, sites of surgery became infected, so that's obviously not the sort of thing he was trying to do, at least at the, at the beginning, he did often observe regression of the tumour. So those people who got an infection as a consequence of the surgery he noted that often these people would actually make better responses after surgery than those who did not get infections. So, you know, he postulated that maybe this is something to do with activating your immune system that then comes along to clear the bacteria, but in so doing, you also alert the immune system to the fact that there's something else here that's not right, which is the bone cancer. So he started to do some pretty... Um, <laughs> risky experiments, let's call them. So he started injecting patients with live bacteria to see if this would help clear their cancers. And it did. In some patients, it certainly did. But often, patients would also suffer very serious side effects from this because they'd be also infected with the bacteria. Um, and so, you know, there were also some um, deaths as a result of this. And he then moved on to using either dead bacteria or using bacterial toxins. And these are the so-called sort of Coley's toxins, which you might sort of read about in, in old sort of immunology um, type studies where there was certainly an effect of using these toxins in, um, 
in generating better responses to these patients who are undergoing um, surgery. But he worked with a guy called um, Ewing. He was in, Ewing was, in fact, um, Coley's boss. And he was a um, proponent of radiotherapy. <coughs> so in the hospital, at the, at the Memorial Hospital in New York, the emphasis was taken away from developing the, the toxins treatment and pushed towards using radiotherapy to kill cancer. So these sorts of trends in um, clinical practice and in research are often sort of dictated and set in place by the people who are um, doing them at, at the time. But Coley had one very staunch supporter, and that was his daughter. So Helen Coley was actually a, um, a housewife, and she had no scientific or clinical background. But she was a very strong advocate for this idea that you should use the body's immune system, not chemicals and radiation, in order to attack and um, uh, uh, kill cancer cells. And so she, with another guy called Cornelius Rhodes, they established what's now called the um, National Cancer Research Institute in, in America, um, who, whose sort of um, founding principle, if you like, was to investigate further the impact of the immune system. And the director of that institute, Lloyd Old, is sort of called the father of modern tumor immunology because since the sort of 60s, they've been doing sort of very um, controlled and focused experiments to really try and get to the bottom of what is this relationship between the immune system and cancer. So a lot of time and effort, a lot of observations, but never really clinching, you know, what, what is the power here of the immune system in fighting this disease? And this has gone on for decades. Even when I started doing cancer immunology, people were still saying, oh, there's no point. You know, the immune system has no role to play in treating cancer. Um, this is a quote from a scientist in, in the US, who I think, James, you know quite well. He said, the argument went, the immune system plays no role in treating cancer, and any scientist who thought so was wasting valuable time and energy. And these were messages given by funding agencies. You know, so, so this is a person who persisted in, in this field, despite you know, probably not getting his grants funded for this reason, and has made huge contributions, actually, to, to this field. So in spite of all of this, he and many others persisted in looking at um, different types of immune cells and what power they may or may not have in fighting cancer. And the, the sort of emphasis really has been placed on studying lymphocytes. So these are one of your uh, white cell types. I won't go into all the different cell types now, but lymphocytes or T cells are special cells because they have the ability to be activated in response to a stimulus. Let's say it's a it's influenza virus, because we know that T cells respond to influenza virus. They'll become very, very activated. They'll kill the, the influenza virus and cells that are infected with the influenza virus. But what they then do is something extremely useful. They form a memory pool. So they remember that they saw the flu before. And this, of course, is the basis of vaccination so that you induce your T-cell response. The T-cell response does its thing, but then it maintains um, immunological memory so that next time that bug comes along, it will remember it was there and it'll go back and kill it more efficiently than the first time, hence why vaccines, um, the basis of how um, vaccines work. So the focus of this now is going to be on these um, T-cells or lymphocytes, and I'll probably call them T-cells and lymphocytes. It's the same I'm referring to the same cell. So what do we know about our lymphocytes? We know that they need to be part of a balanced immune system. And what we want out of a balanced immune system is we want it to fight infection. And in order to do this, as we've already you know, said, it has to protect against bacteria, fungi, all the rest of it. But it has to leave uninfected tissue alone. This is very, very important because you all know about autoimmune diseases, inflammatory diseases. And these are also very, you know, very um, problematic diseases that can cause a lot of damage to the host. So your immune system is an incredibly powerful system, but it's absolutely essential that you keep it in check. So it's got to have a way 
to recognise what is foreign whilst leaving normal tissues and organs alone. That's a balanced immune system that's working as you want it to work. Now, we understand um, by today the molecular mechanisms that allow this, this distinction to be made. So when a bug comes along, a bug will have on it something that um, highlights itself as a foreign object. So it might have a spiky coat, or it might have sugars on its surface that no cells in your body has, or some other kind of marker that makes it different to host tissues, some very general type marker. And that alerts the immune system then that something is wrong. And what it then does, what a lymphocyte will then do, is it will upregulate a particular site of particular type of molecule on its surface. So, you know, it's a normal cell and now it's doing this. It's, it's put on its surface a so-called go signal. And we now know that the molecular identity of such a go signal is a molecule called CD28. And what that then does, it tells other immune cells to get involved in this attack of the bug. So more cells will come along, um, they'll proliferate more, they'll, they'll be attracted to the site of where this infection is, and they'll kill it. And then the, the immune response will, will die out. And all of that is to do with putting on these go signals, responding to these little bits of the pathogen that look different to everything else, putting up the go signals and then going for it. Whereas when a lymphocyte comes by a normal piece of tissue that doesn't have anything unusual to display on its surface, it'll do something different. It'll put a stop signal on, on its surface. So now instead of saying, let's proliferate, let's attract other immune cells to the site, it'll say, no, this is not infected. There is nothing foreign here, so I'm going to put up a stop signal. And now we know the molecular identity of these stop signals. They're called CTLA4, PD-1. Don't have to remember those things, obviously. But the fact that the, the sort of principle is that these things tell the immune system to stop, not to proliferate, and to basically just calm um, down and to, and to pass, pass by. Now, the trouble is cancer cells, especially in their sort of earliest stages, don't express anything on their cell surfaces either to say that they are different. So whilst all these sort of instructions in their DNA are going wrong, whilst they're adapting to this, that, and the other in order to survive, they still don't have any outside markers that mean that they look to an immune cell any different to the tissue from which they arose. So the problem then is that the immune cells start by putting up these stop signals, and that's what persists. So you have lymphocytes often in the vicinity of cancer cells, but they have put up these stop signals. So it was really um, working out the identity of these stop signals that allowed for the development of the first very effective um, cancer immunotherapies. So some people call these stop signals checkpoints. You'll see that often in papers that describe, describe these things. And what um, has been done is that antibodies, that's the little upside-down Y-shaped things um, which are interacting with those red stop signals, they've made antibodies which basically block the stop signals. So these are antibodies such as ipilimumab, nivolumab. Those were the first ones that were made that were given to patients that bind to the stop signals and then basically inactivate them. So you're blocking the blockers. And then you're allowing these lymphocytes to put up the go signals and to proliferate and to attract more immune cells to the site of those cancer. And that interaction has enabled... Um, very robust immune responses to be generated to certain types of cancer, enabling cure, actually, of some previously incurable cancers. And that's all sort of come about within the last sort of five to eight years. And the cancers that respond best to these things are the ones I've listed here, metastatic melanoma, uh, renal cancers, some lung cancers, urothelial cancer, and, and actually by now a few more as well. So this is when cancer immunotherapy became a thing. 
and it was recognized um, in the journal Science in 2013 as the breakthrough of the year. So that's not even, you know, not particularly long ago. And that was based on the work of uh, Tasuku Honjo and Jim Allison, who won the Nobel Prize for this work in um, 2018. And that was for discovery of these stop signals, PD-1 and CTLA-4, and understanding the power that, and that knowing what those molecular mechanisms um, were, um, the power that you then had to create novel immunotherapies targeting um, those, those proteins. And I, I like this quote from Jim Allison when he was interviewed about, you know, his amazing discovery and his Nobel Prize. He said, well, I was really just trying to understand how the immune system works. And, you know, I think that's a shout out to basic science. You know, not everybody who ends up um, uh, generating a fantastic new therapy for, for patients sets out to do that. They set out to understand the biology behind something and in so doing uncover these, you know, amazing um, targets for, for new drugs. So, you know, this is great, but there's still quite, um, there's still a long way to go. You know, we still see um, fantastic successes. So I, I've included this picture here. I think this came from the Daily Mail, but these are the lungs of a lady actually from St. Fagans who had a tumor. She was treated with um, anti-CTLA-4 antibodies and her tumor um, disappeared. And she was one of the, the first people actually to be successfully treated um, at least, you know, in, in sort of in and around Cardiff, and she has come to, along to, to our lab and um, to other talks in Cardiff where she has, you know, talked about her experiences of immunotherapy. So it can be a fantastic thing, but still successful for only a minority of patients, certain types of cancer, and it's extremely toxic. You know, we talk about coli's toxins and the fact that coli killed people by giving live bacteria and then bacterial toxins, but actually even modern immunotherapies can kill people. The toxicity, um, especially in the earliest trials when people didn't know how to um, deal with the toxicity once it had started, didn't know about, you know, how much antibody you should give or which antibody you should give. You know, th these treatments are, are not easy, and I think that's a very important thing to, to understand. And that, of course, is because of the massive immune activation that results from um, blocking these stop signals. So this now is a graph that looks at, well, why is it that only some cancers respond whilst other ones don't? And this looks like a complicated thing, but it's really not. So when you look across the top, you've got all these different types of cancers. And then when you look at the actual graph, you can see loads of little dots. So the lines are made up of tons of little dots all on top of each other, and every dot is one cancer. And what has happened here is that people have sequenced the DNA code of each of those cancers, so thousands of cancers. And then they look at how many mut mutations that particular cancer has acquired. So the ones above the green line are the ones with loads of mutations in, and the ones below, the lower down the dots are, the fewer mutations they have. And these are mutations that could be acquired either through chance or by aging or through, you know, UV light, smoking, whatever. But some cancers have loads of mutations in them. Some cancers have fewer mutations in them. And what has been discovered after doing immunotherapy, you know, sort of over and over again on many, many cancers and sequencing these cancers to get these DNA codes is the realization that it's these cancers, um, sorry, I don't think the pointer likes this screen very much, but it's those cancers above the green line, so the ones with lots of mutations that respond the best to these immunotherapies. And we think that the reason for that is because the more mutations a cancer acquires, then the less like normal tissue it is. So it suddenly starts to have a few things, you know, that mean that the immune system can kind of tell it's different. So that's called immunogenicity. That's the inherent immunogenicity of the cancer, which needs to be combined with blocking the stop signals in order for the whole thing to take off. So, you know, the cancers like melanoma, 
they respond very well to immunotherapy because their cancers are caused by exposure to UV light, which is very mutagenic. Similarly, smoking causes loads of mutations. And then that those cancers actually respond better to immunotherapy than lung cancers from non-smokers because the degree of difference between those cancers and other ones is greater. Um, and that seems to be a pattern now that is... Um, you know, being sustained as more and more tumours become um, sequenced. And, of course, that's the sort of work that's being done at an enormous speed um, all over the world now. And people deposit their, their DNA sequences into um, databases where everyone can share and study these sequences um, and, and see these patterns emerging out of them. So this looks like a horrible um, slide with loads and loads of scientific terms in. But what I want you to focus on is the fact that, first of all, this is colorectal cancer. There's lots of different subtypes of colon cancer. Here's four of them, CMS 1, 2, 3, and 4. But what I want you to focus on is number one, because number one has this <coughs> word there which is called hypermutation. So there is a subset of colon cancers that, again, have loads and loads of mutations. So what that means is that this is the only subtype of colorectal cancer that responds really well to immunotherapy. The next slide is not for squeamish people, but I am going to put it up because it is so remarkable in what you see in it. So this is a um, hypermutated colorectal cancer. So when you look at baseline, that is what one of these tumours actually looks like. So this is pretty advanced disease. So these people, and you can see this is a very recent study, are given immunotherapy and then three months later, you can't see the tumour anymore, and neither you can at six months. So this is a complete response to immunotherapy. And when you look down the bottom here, you're actually looking here at frozen sections through these tumours that have then been stained in the laboratory for immune markers. So the first one is before treatment, and there it's all very disorganised, very tumour-looking, not a lot of immune cells, which are white and red, and then when you start the treatment after six weeks, and particularly at three months, the yellow, the red, the white, this is all immune cells now coming into the tumour and destroying it because it's gone. You look at the top, those are photographs of the same colon. The tumour has been heavily immune infiltrated and completely destroyed. These are remarkable results which come up, came about from a clinical study that was only carried out in the last sort of 24 months probably mostly last year. And the idea was in this clinical study that after the first dose of immunotherapy, the patients would then go on to receive chemo radiotherapy, but not a single patient from here has progressed or recurred, so they've all just had their immunotherapy. And to date, and the range you know, is 6 to 25 months later, they are all effectively cancer-free. So hopefully this will remain like this, and it's a, you know, a huge um, success, I think, for this type of treatment. So I think you know, there is still potential for more success. There are still limitations, of course. It's still only successful in some patients, but we are learning more about the nature of a successful response because with every treated patient, you have an experiment something that you can study in great detail and work out, well, why did it work in that patient and not in that patient? And the more you learn about the property of the cancer or the property of that person's immune system, the more you can build into the next clinical study in order to improve it and to make it more focused. And we can talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. Successful only in certain cancers, well, we're learning more about those. And then the toxicity. This is a big problem. As I mentioned right at the start, you know, these are not treatments for um, faint-hearted. These are treatments that do cause autoimmunity. They do cause inflammation. But nurses, doctors are learning about how to mitigate and treat these um, side effects. So this is also becoming much less of a problem. So the opportunities, I think, and scope for improvement are enormous. And we'll just touch a little bit on some of those um, now. So first of all, there are adoptive T-cell therapies. <coughs> so, so far, I've only talked about the antibodies, but there are other things that you can do. So you can take a patient's blood 
a patient who has a cancer and who may also have metastatic disease, you can purify T cells from their blood, then you can activate them in vitro in a, lab, in a laboratory setting. You can um, activate them to put on the go signals. You can activate them to make them grow more. You can also genetically engineer them to make them better killers or better at seeking out and finding the cancer that they need to kill. So this is what I mean about understanding the properties of a successful T cell. Because once you know what they are, you can actually confer them onto the T cell before you then infuse them back into a patient. And these sorts of studies are going on all the time with individual patients receiving this type of um, experimental treatment with some real successes. And you know, a lot of this work is actually going on here in Cardiff. This is a very sort of... Um, in detail slide here that looks at actual crystal structures of these complexes. You know, how does a T cell really see what's being displayed on a cancer cell and using that sort of molecular information to guide how to genetically improve a T cell to make it better at attacking um, a cancer cell. The other thing that you may read about are these CAR T cells. So that means you, you, you create what's called a super T cell by actually engineering a new receptor that you can put onto the T cell, which is designed to um, see something that's selectively um, displayed on the surface of, of a tumor. So this is normally not like a, the same as what um, pathogens have, you know, spikes and sugars and so on. This will be some sort of self-protein that's overexpressed on a cancer. And then you can engineer these receptors to, to basically go along and pick out cells that have that protein on their surface. And those super T cells can then um, very effectively kill those cancer cells. And I think one interesting thing about CAR T cells that I've mentioned on the slide here is that they were actually developed many years ago um, not for the purpose of seeking out and killing cancers, but actually for seeking out and killing HIV-infected cells. So I think this speaks to that sort of innovation and you know, creativity amongst this sort of community of people who are engineering these receptors, where you repurpose research and treatments that you were developing for a certain disease in order to try and tackle and, and, and treat a, diff, a completely different disease. And... Um, Carl June, who's um, been um, a sort of phenomenal um, driver of this particular type of research, he's based in Philadelphia, worked on CAR T cells in the context of HIV and said we had to stop working on it because, you know, treatments for HIV came about and they were so good you didn't need CAR T cells anymore. And it's been resurrected now in the context of, of blood cancers in particular, where they seem to work um, extremely well, actually. So this is definitely a rapidly expanding field. Then um, the other type of cell that is targeted for the purpose of immunotherapy is the so-called regulatory T cell. This is an interesting cell type because it's another kind of T cell, but its job is to regulate. So, so far, I've only been talking about these aggressor T cells, you know, the killers, the super killers, the seek and destroy cells. But you've also got, actually, within your um, immune system, within your T cells, another subset that has slightly different functions and their role really is to make sure the immune system doesn't go out of control. So it's the kind of cell that, you know, people with autoimmune diseases, <coughs> excuse me, often have fewer of them or they have regulatory T cells that may not function quite right. So their immune system's a bit out of control and it's a feature of autoimmunity. But in the case of cancer, a regulatory T cell can be a problem because it's dampening down anti-cancer T cell responses because it perceives them to be immune responses that you don't want because they're killing cells that look like normal tissue. So another way of boosting your anti-cancer immune responses could be to target these regulatory T cells. And we have done some work in Cardiff to, to look at this by repurposing a chemotherapy drug. So this is a drug called cyclophosphamide, which is often used in very high doses <coughs> excuse me, to directly kill cancer cells. 
But if you use it at low doses, what we've discovered is that it will selectively target regulatory T cells. The reasons for that are pretty complicated, and I won't go into it now, but um, this is a thing that happens. And this, in this particular trial here that was carried out in Cardiff, people with metastatic colorectal cancer were given low-dose cyclophosphamide just to see if it did, in fact, target regulatory T cells in the way that we had hypothesized. And we found that, yes, indeed, it did, and that patients who um, responded well to the low-dose cyclophosphamide had a longer progression-free survival than those that didn't. Of course, this is um, treating patients with inoperable disease, so you're not expecting to see... Um, huge successes in terms of anti-cancer responses here. But moving on from that, um, the next clinical study will also focus on colorectal cancer, but this time will focus on earlier stage disease. So in the case of colorectal cancer, what happens is that if you have an early stage disease, then that cancer is confined to the bowel wall. And normally, surgery will completely take care of this. Similarly, for stage 2 cancer, Often, um, this has gone through the bowel wall, but it's still something that's very curable by surgery. Stage 3 cancer is a little bit more dicey because now you've got involvement of lymph nodes, so your sort of lymph glands also have some cancer cells in them. And it's often difficult to be sure, you know, when you've surgically removed your cancer, that you've removed everything. So there, there is a sort of... 40 percent, 35 to 40 percent chance that your cancer will recur. Stage um, four cancer is very, very difficult to treat, impossible almost because this has now metastasized to other organs. So moving on to the next clinical study that will start this year, the idea is that you take patients, you recruit patients into the study who have had their stage three and some stage two tumors removed. And the idea is to give them low-dose cyclophosphamide after resection to see whether or not reducing your Tregs, regulatory T cells, boosts your immune response enough to prevent cancer recurrence. So that is a study that will open um, very soon, actually, in, in Cardiff. As well as regulatory T cells, you know, PD-1 and CTLA-4 are not the only stop signals. There are other stop signals. LAG-3 is a newly, um, is, is one that's come to the fore quite recently as another potential target. So you can make antibodies to block LAG-3, and these are being tested in clinical studies all over the world, actually, right now. Um, I'm aware of time, um, so a few more slides, okay, yeah. So um, this is a, an example of some work also being carried out in our lab to look at triple negative breast cancer. So this represents 10 to 20% of breast cancers, and it doesn't respond very well to the sort of current treatments, you know, hormone treatments um, and so on. It's quite an aggressive cancer that's difficult to treat. But again, it's one of these, in terms of breast cancers, with the highest mutational loads. So you'd think, well, maybe this one will be more amenable to immunotherapy. And that's what we're trying to understand um, now. So we have evidence in model systems that if you do nothing, every uh, cancer will grow. If you use a certain type of inhibitor that targets regulators, don't worry about the nature of the inhibitor, that doesn't matter, it's something that targets regulatory T cells, then you see, start to see some responses. So let's say out of 10 growing tumors there, five of them have been controlled. So you're getting somewhere, but not getting everywhere yet. If we use um, an antibody that targets this other stop signal called LAG3, nothing happens. They're all growing. So anti-LAG3, LAG3 blockade doesn't work in this particular, uh, for this particular breast cancer. However, what we did notice is that those tumors that did grow, despite being treated with the anti-regulatory T-cell therapy, all now put the LAG3 stop signal up on their um, surfaces. So if you now come in and target both the regulators and then LAG3, you then manage to control every single cancer. So um, the, the point here really is to um, 
demonstrate how this evolution happens. You know, so you come in with one drug and it will do something, but then some of the cancer cells will respond to that by putting up another um, way of avoiding the immune system. You've got to learn what that is so you can come back with treatment number two, which wouldn't have had any effect in the first place because it hadn't responded in that way in the first instance, but it evolved in order to do so. So you've got to catch up with it and come in with treatment number two. And understanding this and knowing you know, what does what and when is a huge challenge at this time for um, people working on cancer immunotherapies because you've always got to try and second guess what the cancer is going to do. And of course, they do different things in different people. So trying to get on top of that is a major challenge, but you know, obviously holds enormous potential for personalized treatments, I suppose, going forward. The other thing that's, um, I, I think, going through a bit of a resurrection in interest and enthusiasm is development of cancer vaccines. And here, you know, I'd like to uh, mention Professor Sir Leslie Borisovich, who actually uh, was the professor of medicine in Cardiff. And he, in fact, performed Europe's first trial of a vaccine for HPV, that's human papilloma virus, to treat cervical cancer in Europe. And Professor Borisovich is, you know, still, his papers are still cited for this um, work that was published in the Lancet in 1996. And at, at the time, it was a phenomenal um, and very exciting piece of work where, you know, he used a vaccine to induce immune responses in, um, in women with some effect on cervical cancer. And that you know, certainly predated this massive excitement in immunotherapy. But those sorts of old studies combined with the resurgence on the huge um, sort of um, advances that have been made in vaccine technology for obvious reasons over the last sort of five or six years are now um, being used to, for the, in order to drive forward development of novel cancer vaccines. So that means using the RNA vaccines, using recombinant adenovirus vaccines, the very same backbones that we've been using to make our COVID vaccines. And in fact, it's interesting that the RNA vaccines, like the, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines and so on, were actually all developed initially as cancer vaccines. And, you know, that was the purpose. Um, the companies like BioNTech and Pfizer, they, were, they, they had put effort into RNA vaccines for the purpose of creating vaccines to um, treat cancer. But then, of course, that all sort of switched to COVID as the pandemic started. But now it's switching back. And so these people are really taking up the mantle of generating, using, you know, all the amazing things they've learned during COVID to produce even better and even informed um, strategies for, for cancer patients. And the exciting way of using these could be to treat those patients who have had their tumors resected. So the, the bulk of the tumor's gone, it's been cut out by the surgeon, you then vaccinate, you induce your immune responses, um, and those memory cells will take care of any cancer cell, that's the hope that um, arise, you know, if that tumour is still there somewhere in the body. So the idea would be that these vaccines should be there to prevent recurrence. Then the very last thing I'm going to mention to you is about blood vessels. So, you know, one of my own personal interests and um, areas of lab research is in trying to understand blood vessel networks in tumours. And what we do know is that not all blood vessels are the same. Some blood vessels feed the tumor cells with nutrients and they feed them, feed them with oxygen and they help them grow. Other types of vessels are actually really, really good at delivering immune cells to tumors. And so if you can harness that type of blood vessel, they're actually called high endothelial venules for any other enthusiasts in the room. Um, these have a very, very specialized job, which is about the trafficking and transport of immune cells. And here, you know, you're looking at um, a slide where we're looking at 3D images of these blood vessel networks in whole tumors. And you can see um, here we're looking at tumors that were not treated, tumors that did not respond to immunotherapy, or tumors that did respond to immunotherapy. And you can see the density of these good blood vessels, the ones that deliver immune cells, is very much increased in those that 
respond to therapy. Um, and I know why it's gone stuck here, because the next one is a video, and it probably doesn't like it. Ah, there you go. Um, oh, you've got to see it now that I've got that far. It's always a glitch with videos, isn't there? Double-edged sword. Go on, move. Well, anyway, this was supposed to rotate and show you a beautiful three-dimensional image of a um, blood vessel network. And here's another example of that. It's very sad to me that it's... An, oh, it is moving. The one that's moving is the one that doesn't have the um, dense vessel network in it. But the point is that the um, density of these vessels correlates with how many immune cells you have in these cancers and how um, a cancer may or may not... Ah, OK. Um, shrink as a result of immunotherapy. So this is the slide that actually shows you that. So the, the, the top is, a, again, one of these frozen sections through a tumour that you stain in the lab. The pink and um, the purple cells are immune cells. The bits of green, like here, are actually uh, these kind of specialised blood vessels. And when you have these specialised blood vessels, you can see you have lots and lots of immune cells. They're really efficient at letting immune cells in, and this cancer shrinks. Whereas this cancer that doesn't have a lot of immune cells in has none of these special blood vessels. This cancer keeps growing. So this, again, offers a whole new um, idea for combination therapy, where you're not just looking at the immune system, you're actually looking at altering the blood vessels as well so that you can um, create the perfect partnership where you've got the right blood vessels in the tumour. So if you do induce your immune response, all those immune cells can get in. Because you can often see um, cancers that have been treated with immunotherapy will be there as a sort of blob of cancer cells with immune cells all around them, unable to actually penetrate that tumour mass. So it, it's a significant bottleneck. And by understanding you know, how you can induce these types of vessels, you ought to be able to um, eventually break down that bottleneck. So that then takes me to the last slide. So significant breakthrough or untapped potential, I think it's fair to say it's significant breakthrough and untapped potential. But the challenge is, is you know, getting some proper rationale in place for combination therapies, how, when, what you know, should be done in order to play um, the cat and mouse game as effectively as possible. You've got to understand the molecular features of different types of cancers, and that's becoming almost like um, a, an easy job, a, 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 a sort of day-to-day -day job that can be done in routine laboratories where you can get the whole genetic code of a tumour very, very quickly and understand its sort of molecular um, features and understand where cells are inside it and, and so on by imaging methods that are also becoming, you know, much, much better. And the idea then is that hopefully we'll be able to, at some point, tailor treatments for individual patients with certain types of, of cancer. And I think this iceberg um, figure really is just to show that I think our success is just the tip of the iceberg and that the rest now is about not just immunology, it's about all sorts of things. You, know, it's, you have to understand the cancer as well as the immune system. It's about um, improving our imaging tools, our ability to measure you know, the genetic lesions in a tumour, to engineer new solutions, radio makes everything. So it's about everyone working together, really, through you know, all these different disciplines to create sort of multidisciplinary solutions to, to all of it. Um, so these, this is my lab, you know, I want to thank all of them, I'm not going to go through them um, name by name, but, and also, of course, our funders, and DIVA, the Development and Alumni Department at Cardiff University, who also um, support our lab. And, uh, James, I thought I would just put up, oh, no, I didn't mean to do that, um, Kath's, so, uh, slide right at the end. Um, so Kath Rees is a um, medic, I think, isn't she? I've never, never met her. 
fifth year medical student at Villinger Hospital who's actually giving patients immunotherapy as part of the training she's doing there. And Kath asked me if I could put this slide up at the end be, to draw attention first to the Little Princess Trust, where you cut your hair off and donate it to charity to make wigs. Both my daughters have done that as well, actually, and they had very long hair. So if anyone wants to do that, that's where you go. And um, she's also doing a fundraising, fundraising event at Valindra that she wanted me to, to mention to you guys here, which is um, specifically for supporting the immunotherapy stuff that they are they're doing there. Thank you. Well, it also overran. I'm very sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, our, um, as someone who spends his time trying to convey the complexities of the immune system to undergraduate students, I can speak firsthand how well, how well you've done this evening at conveying these very complex oh, thank you, James. Uh, concepts. So thanks, Alan. I'm sure it's uh, provoked uh, uh, a number of uh, questions in our audience. Of course, yeah. Uh, would anyone like to, um, I'm also happy for people to email me if they want to, you know, ask anything. Yes. Easy to find my address. So, Alan, um, maybe uh, whilst uh, our audience are maybe thinking of uh, a question or uh, having the courage to ask a question, if I could just start off, Alan, with that correlation between uh, the number of mutations in a particular cancer, mm. how well. Uh, patients then respond to immunotherapies, are there ever any anomalies in that correlation and can we learn anything from those anomalies? Yes, well I think so. It's, so you know, you might, what matters at the end of the day is whether you're displaying something relevant to the immune system, isn't it? So what those, that mutational load is, it's just a surrogate marker because, you know, if you've got a thousand mutations, then you're more likely to present something relevant to the immune system than if you've got 10 mutations. Yeah. But then it only takes one mutation to do it, you know. So there are anomalies in that way. Um, but I think it still all boils down to the same thing in the sense that you've got to have something relevant to present. So yeah. conceivably, we might still be able to develop therapies for some of these other I think so, because the CAR T cells see something different, doesn't it? So, you know, those can... So the, the problem... CAR T cells are very good at seeking out blood cancers. Okay. And that's because, you know, they're in your blood, they travel along, they find the cancer cell, they kill it. What they're not good at is getting into a solid cancer. So they all have different bottlenecks. But I think... You know, we have focused our immunotherapy efforts very much on the killer cell. And we have to maybe now focus a little bit more on trying to find ways of making a cancer cell look more different. And that's a whole new challenge, isn't it? But, you know, I think going forward, maybe that's somewhere to, to look. Because I think now you know how to induce massive immune responses. Yeah. Well, some of them have hardly any, actually. So it's not always the case. You have to have had some um, mutation or, you know, to have become a cancer cell. So you may... Um, but I'm just wondering if that's strictly true. Because you could just be upregulating oncogenes, you know, that help you proliferate, and downregulating tumor suppressor genes. So it's a more kind of sterile, if you like, um, form of cancer development. Whereas other cancers come about as a result of exposure to mutagens. And those are the ones, you know, with high numbers of mutations cigarettes, UV light other carcinogens that you can think of, asbestos, 
you know, those ones, loads of mutations, the ones that come about from genetic aberrations, lesions, have less mutations because they can acquire the hallmarks of cancer without having had to have done that. Do you see what I mean? Am I explaining that? So that's the reason why you've got this huge spectrum. And those with very few mutations are uh, the hardest to treat with these conventional T-cell therapies. Um, so I was just going to ask, maybe it's not a very intelligent question, but um, with stage 4 cancer, um, so you said that it's very difficult to treat. Does it mean that there are patients that sometimes actually can get cured of the cancer? Do you mean, did you say triple negative breast cancer? Uh, no. Stage 4. Oh, cancer. stage 4, yeah. sorry, sorry. Um, yes, stage 4 cancer is pretty much incurable for most of those cancers. Not for melanoma, that is what immunotherapy has done. So, you know, for some of these, um, you can actually, that, that is the thing, in fact, you can treat stage four cancers. You know, melano metastatic melanoma can now be treated. Um, so, yeah, I'm wrong in saying that it's always incurable. That, in fact, is what, you know, immunotherapy has done for these cancers, is cured the incurable. But those are still that very small minority of tumours, again, that have these high mutational loads. And melanoma is the best one. I, you know, we think it's, the, it's also the most um, studied one. It's also the one that's been subject to the most clinical trials and um, things get approved first for melanoma. But it does relate to its, um, uh, its mutational burden. You know, it, it's the fact that a melanoma actually has markers that distinguish it from normal melanocytes, which are your you know, non-malignant counterpart to a melanoma. And that comes about as a result of UV light directly damaging your DNA. Mm. And the nature of um, the relevant, you know, they're called antigens. Which, what's actually seen by a T-cell is called an antigen. And so if you if you think of, um, you know, uh, a, a high antigen burden as the cell's antigenicity, then a melanoma has a high antigenicity. And you can actually track and measure those T-cell responses very, very um, easily compared to other cancers because the antigens sh show themselves so much more um, than, uh, than you see in other tumor types. So it's clearly a st sort of standout thing, you know, in, in terms of um, the, the, the markers of non-self it displays. Yeah. And then those stage four cancers that don't have those markers are still incurable. Are we, are we making any progress in identifying those patients who might respond to uh, the therapy? Uh, can we... Some. Okay. Some progress. Um, because sequencing, you know, the DNA is becoming so much easier, of course, it's not a commonplace thing to do, but you can, um, you can do it and, it, and it is done sometimes. So you could say a high mutation of burden um, where you see these stop signals being expressed, so you can use antibodies to see, does the tumour express PD-1? And if it does, it's more likely to respond to anti-PD-1. They're not cut and dry, though, James. So even then, you know, there are still some mysteries there that make it a bit difficult to predict. To, to yes. Those yeah, and there's a, you know, that's a massive thing. Because as I said, you know, these immunotherapies are pretty aggressive treatments. So you don't want to be just giving no. them to people who are not going to respond, yeah. for sure. Um, Colorectal cancer, the CMS1 ones, you know, that's a definite marker now, and that's a routine thing that you would do, look to see if they, ha they belong in that classification, and then you could give them, yeah, anti-PD-1. But that, again, is, I would say, an exception in its, um, you know, in the way that it segregates so well. Mm. Uh, gentleman at the back, if I could just... Um, I was wondering, with immunotherapies being such a new development, 
How often are they used nowadays compared to, let's say, radiotherapy and chemotherapy? And does it look like they'll be more commonly used in the future compared to radiotherapy and chemotherapy? Yeah, well, I think for some, for melanoma now, it's become like a first-line treatment. Um, I don't know about any other tumours that it's first line yet. I don't know if there's a clinician in the room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I think you'd still try other things first for everything else. But for melanoma, it's now FDA approved as the first line treatment. And I suspect, you know, that will be a trend that continues, that for other cancers it might fall in. It's really difficult, as I understand it, from the point of view of an oncologist to change a treatment. So this whole thing takes years to sort of um, go from one clinical practice to another. But obviously it does happen, and, the, and I think the trend here is definitely going to be for more immunotherapy. Be, be just because, you know, I, I don't remember what the last number was, but there are thousands of immunotherapy trials going on around the world every day now, trying different combinations, different, targeting different cancers at uh, different stages. And out of that will sometimes drop out something that's quite clear-cut, like that colorectal study, which is amazing. That will uh, change something, I'm sure. But that's only just been published. So, yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. See, these are the questions that I'm not. I'm not so good at. Um, Kath Reese should have come, shouldn't she? She would know the answer to this. Again, you know, I think the answer's a bit the same. So it's given for melanoma, I think for um, non-small cell lung cancer and bladder cancer. But still, there'll be indications around that, you know, um, whether it won't be first line, it'll be after you've tried this and that. But it will be... For, and renal cell cancer, actually, that's another one where it is, you know different types of immunotherapies, like with melanoma, have been tried actually over many years, things like interleukin-2 and um, other, other sort of immune-related things. So I think it's becoming more commonplace. I'm sorry, that's not a great answer, is it? But if you were to, you know, a patient presenting, coming in with melanoma, advanced melanoma would definitely get treated with it. Mm. <laughs> Ah, well, I don't think we know the answer to that question. Or if we do, I don't think it's been reported. But, hmm. I do think that there will be parameters that the clinician will look at to decide whether or not you could be, you know, you're fit enough to um, receive immunotherapy. But that may, that may not, you know, those two things that you mentioned may not be a factor. Yes, that definitely would play a, a role in it, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so if you're autoimmune prone, you know, that sort of thing, that would, be, that would definitely be part of um, the consideration. Well, yeah. I, I, mean, I think we're going to have to draw things to a conclusion, but I'd just like to say once again what a fascinating, inspiring uh, lecture you've uh, provided us this evening and I'd like the uh, youngsters in the audience to maybe go away with that um, with that lesson you uh, mentioned about how when one sets out in a research career you never know from researching the basics how that can potentially eventually lead to uh, clinical therapy so a great message to, to go away with this evening so thanks very much indeed <laughs>
uh, talking on uh, multiple realities, how our senses define our world. So that's Thursday, the 2nd of February. Safe journey home, everyone. Thank you.